Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Bill Burns, the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome Bob Zellick to discuss his terrific new book, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. This is a profoundly challenging moment for Americans at home and abroad amidst a terrible pandemic and its economic consequences, amidst the domestic dysfunctions, inequalities, and racial injustice that the pandemic has exposed in such sharp relief, and amidst the diplomatic disruptions of the Trump era on an increasingly complicated and competitive international landscape, it's not easy to see the way ahead. The starting point for finding and navigating that path is to understand how we got to this point to understand where we've been and what has animated American foreign policy at its best and at its worst over more than two centuries. That's what Bob Zellick does for us in this exceptional book, full of rich narrative, well-crafted character portraits and elegant insights. None of that should come as a surprise. Uh, always a keen student of history, Bob is one of America's most accomplished statesmen. He has served as president of the World Bank Group, as deputy secretary of state, as the US trade representative, as deputy chief of staff at the White House, and as counselor at both the treasury and state departments. And just as important from my very parochial point of view, Bob is today an invaluable member of the Carnegie Endowment Board of Trustees. Bob's focus throughout America in the world is on the pragmatism that has shaped the approach of America's diplomatic practitioners since our country's founding, a problem-solving bent that has in many ways set American diplomacy apart from European and other tra uh, traditions. But American foreign policy is also a story of persistent tensions between a pragmatic preoccupation with our national experiment across a vast continent and the sense of exceptionalism that has episodically drawn us into sometimes badly misguided efforts to remake the rest of the world too. Bob's new book could not be better timed at this plastic moment in international order when the era of uncontested American primacy has faded. Geopolitical competition has reemerged with a vengeance in huge new challenges of climate change and global health and the revolution in technology stretch beyond the reach of any one country. And that means that diplomacy matters more than ever as America's tool of first resort and that the historical sweep and insight of Bob's book are all the more significant. So I urge all of you who haven't already done so to buy a copy or three. You'll see a link on the screen during the course of our discussion to help you do that. I'll begin today's conversation with a few questions, but promise to leave plenty of time for yours, which you can submit through YouTube's chat function. So thanks again for joining us. And Bob, congratulations again. It's great to be with you, at least in this virtual world. Um, let's start at the beginning. Why did you write this book? And what do you hope that readers will take away from it? Well, first of all, let me, let me thank uh, you and, uh, and, and Carnegie and for all the people joining this on a, on a Monday morning. Um, well, particularly for a Carnegie audience, many people may recall that Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy about 25 years ago. Uh, and in the book, he used uh, history to talk about diplomacy and foreign policy. But at the time I read it, I felt it was very much uh, written from a European perspective. So for the past couple decades while doing other things, I've been thinking about how would I approach this from the American experience and talk about some of the ideas that have uh, affected US foreign policy. So as you mentioned, the approach I tried to take was to focus on people and episodes and stories about the practical work of diplomacy, trying to share some of my insights uh, from experience. Um, but also I had a, another purpose, which is uh, the, the field of diplomatic history is somewhat faded over the years. And for understandable reasons, people have wanted to include different uh, perspectives and groups and ideas that have been left out. But it's led to a certain fragmentation. And I was struck by a comment that Fred Logoval, a historian at Harvard, made about why don't we teach political history anymore? So one of the purposes of this book was to 
try to recall some of the importance and synthesis of, of diplomatic history. And in particular, from my conversation with uh, former colleagues, uh, often younger, I had a sense that insofar as diplomatic history was taught, it focused on, only on the end of World War II, the Cold War, and then the post-Cold War period. And I think there's a tremendous amount to be learned from the first 150 years of American history. So I wanted to recall some of those, those figures and times. And there was one other perhaps aspect that your opening comments suggested, which was in many of those periods, the United States didn't enjoy overwhelming power, but we still had to conduct our diplomacy. So I think there's lessons to be learned when the United States doesn't have all domain dominance, as, uh, as former Secretary Mattis mentioned. And in fact, sometimes had a relatively weak hand to play. Well, thanks, Robin. Just as you mentioned, and as I said at the outset, one of the really compelling features of the book are the terrific portraits of leading practitioners and their stories, as well as the ways in which they embodied certain ideas in U.S. foreign policy. Now, some of those are very well known for their contributions to diplomacy from Ben Franklin through Teddy Roosevelt and the architects of containment after World War II, but some are not usually associated with foreign policy like uh, President Lincoln and his Secretary of State William Seward, uh, without whose diplomacy to keep Great Britain and France out of the Civil War, our own history uh, might have turned out a lot differently. So just in the spirit of what you mentioned earlier, tell us a little bit about Abraham Lincoln's foreign policy. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I, I uh, you know, The Civil War is obviously much covered by historians, but it tends to be battles and generals and more recently uh, social movements. And you find relatively few books about the foreign policy of the United States during the Civil War. But it was absolutely fundamental uh, to the success. So recall in, in 1861, when the Civil War uh, opens, the outgoing Buchanan administration had been pretty lackadaisical. And in fact, a lot of its representatives abroad were just assuming that secession would occur. So Lincoln and Seward first have a job of trying to raise the cost of anybody who's going to recognize the South. So they have a combination of threat, but also restraint. They're, they're engaging in brinksmanship uh, because they don't, in Lincoln's words, uh, want to have more than one war at a time. And so this first uh, comes to the fore in November of 1861, the first year of the war when uh, the United States Navy intercepts uh, a British mail packet that has three commissioners. It's uh, HMS Trent, three Confederate commissioners. And it hauls them off. Um, and it's seen as a great success uh, in a year where the US, United States didn't have many battlefield victories. But in London, it's seen as the ultimate insult. And Palmerston in his 70s had a lot of gripes about the United States. He was sort of re ready in his own way for a fight moves uh, troops to Canada, starts to plan an attack on Portland if, if need be, um, and sends basically an ultimatum to Lincoln and Seward. And one of the interesting little twists was that uh, before he sends the ultimatum, he, he sends it uh, to the Queen and Prince Albert, who is going to die from typhoid in about two weeks. Uh, manages to suggest toning down the message while leaving the substance so as to save face uh, for the Americans. And this ends up being quite critical. And so the message arrives shortly before uh, Christmas, and basically it gives the United States seven days to either release these guys or, the, the, uh, or Britain is going to sort of break off relations. And this is where Seward comes in with very creative lawyering. Um, so uh, Seward finds a... Uh, an episode of former Secretary of State Madison, where, as many people will recall, the British used to haul people off American ships. And, and he basically says, well, it turns out the British have accepted our position that you can't take people off ships unless you bring them to, to prize courts. So of course, now that Britain has accepted our legal position, we need to you know, follow the principle and return the Confederate commissioners. But it's an interesting little example of uh, kind of the danger that the United States faced, which then comes about uh, a few months later in 1862. The cotton shortage in Britain leads to great unrest, uh, concern for the textile industry. And in today's parlance, we'd call this the question of humanitarian intervention. 
And I got this focus because in the 90s, a period you were working on a lot of these issues with the Balkans and others, um, I invited Sir Michael Howard, a British military historian, to an event at Aspen. And he used this incident in 1862 to say, you know, what are the challenges of humanitarian intervention? So the British, and to a degree, were French, were trying to say, look, should we mediate? Should we recognize the Confederacy? Should we offer arbitration? Should we try to have a ceasefire? And the United States has to make very clear that intervention will not be costless uh, because uh, uh, sometimes there was a thought about, well, would the United States then perhaps sort of invade Canada? And so the British hold off um, for a while and they hold off until September of 1862, the Battle of Antietam. And that adds the third interesting incident because uh, as many of these viewers will recall, the, the at least uh, apparent success at Antietam created the basis for Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Up to that point, the war was not formally about slavery, it was about uh, preserving the Union. But the first reaction of the British and the government is actually a bit of a surprise to people because keep in mind, uh, they had what they called the Indian Mutiny in 1857. So they see that Lincoln is basically inviting servile insurrection. They're not freeing the slaves everywhere, they're just freeing them in the South. So uh, Polistern actually reacts quite negatively to this, but, and here's the interesting part, as the months go on, the United States actually works in Britain with workers groups. Uh, uh, Lincoln sends a letter to the laborers in Manchester to try to uh, emphasize the importance of the anti-slavery attitude. So now we're starting to see the development of an Anglo-American public opinion, the role of public diplomacy, and eventually that moves the middle and working classes of Britain to the side of the United States uh, in the conflict. There's one other piece that's interesting though for those interested in North American history. This is the same time that Napoleon III of France uh, lands forces into Mexico and marches them to Mexico City where he installs Emperor Maximilian, uh, a Habsburg on the throne. The United States obviously didn't like this idea, but the question was, what could it do about it? <clears throat> and at the same time, Seward and Lincoln didn't want to encourage the French to <clears throat> recognize the Confederacy, so they have a very fine balance. And uh, Seward says, uh, compromise nothing, surrender nothing. They don't recognize the, the government uh, in Mexico City. But at the same time, they try to keep the French sort of on edge. And <clears throat> Benito Juarez, who is the leader of the Republican forces in Mexico, uh, urges U.S. help, but the United States, Lincoln tells the representative, look, the best thing we can do is to win our own war, and then we'll be in a position to help you. So that's what happens. <clears throat> and then Grant sends Philip Sheridan and a large army to the border where in his words, we said, we will show <clears throat> them neutrality in the French and British sense of the word. So he's ready to intervene. And in fact, he comes up with the idea of sending one of his uh, sort of General Schofield with a volunteer army, a corps to support Juarez. But Seward, who had been opposed to the first Mexican war, realizes the danger of an exit strategy and the danger of another intervention in Mexico. So he actually gets President Johnson to send Schofield off to Paris to see Napoleon III, who never, by the way, agrees to see him. And he realizes that sort of events can take their own course. And so sure enough, the Mexicans chase out uh, Maximilian or and, uh, his forces, he's actually uh, killed. And by 1867, you've got three republics in North America because the Canadian Confederation was formed in, in 1867 in part because Britain was concerned about the vengeance of the Union that might sort of take over the colony. And that leads to the last part, which I think even many students of American foreign policy are unaware of, which was you often read about the importance of the Union in the early 19th century, this almost mystical concept for the founders and the, or the generation that followed them. Um, after uh, t the dealing with slavery in the Civil War, which was seen as the, the the terrible sin that had poisoned the, the, the Union. The notion of the Union as a way of conducting international relations actually spreads, whether it's Confederation, Federation, or others. 
Seward is in some ways an extremely far-sighted individual. He, he starts to talk about the notion of a North American Union, not necessarily in a political sense, but he thinks about um, the economic power of the United States, the magnet of the United States. He thinks about uh, commerce as the god beyond sort of borders. And of course, uh, at least as uh, some people in Alaska and others will remember, he decides he wants to add a little bit to the sort of the peaceful expansion. So he, of course, buys Alaska, which everyone knows. But many people are unaware that he almost got British Columbia. He wanted to get the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, but he couldn't. So he ended up with a trade agreement that eventually led to the arrangement. He, he bought the Virgin Islands uh, in the Caribbean, in part for the protecting the Caribbean area. But Congress doesn't go along with it. So that doesn't happen until 1917. And rather relevant for today, he wants to buy Greenland and Iceland. Uh, so it, he's, a, he's a shaper of American thinking, including across the Pacific, that in some ways plants the seeds of thought beyond. So here's the Civil War foreign policy, which very few people know about, and yet becomes quite significant in shaping American thought. Yeah, in a period, just as you described, Bob, of, of quite artful American diplomacy at a time when Again, as you mentioned, the United States was playing a relatively weak hand. And when, especially 1861, 1862, the temptation for Great Britain to intervene, you know, was pretty powerful as well. So, no, it's a, it's a really interesting and, and not particularly well understood episode that you bring to life in the book. Another um, less well-known figure in American foreign policy was Elihu Root, the Secretary of State under Teddy Roosevelt more than a century ago. Um, and a shaper of America's very complicated international law tradition. He also happened to be the first president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace more than a century ago. So what should we know about Root? So um, for the audience, this is part of an ongoing discussion that Bill and I had, which is when you ever get back in the Carnegie Endowment building, you'll see these rooms that are named after people who most people forget. And I've argued to Bill, we need to keep those names so people ask, well, who were these people? What did they do? And this is part of the American history uh, uh, before uh, World War II. And, and Root, as Bill mentioned, is part of the venerable but vexed tradition of American international law. And the, one key point I want to make in this chapter is that sometimes over recent decades, some people are critical about uh, the nature of international law, whether it recognizes power. And Root is a clear example of people that were very practical men, uh, had a sense of power. These certainly were not utopians. And it's important to understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to engage internationally while avoiding old European balance of power, which they thought left to conflict, while avoiding alliances, which had been put off the table by Washington and Jefferson but also uh, eventually trying to avoid some of the collective security notions that Woodrow Wilson had uh, in the League of Nations and trying to avoid isolationism. So it's an example of one of these ways in which the United States explores ideas that persist and continue in the American debate, but sometimes we lose track of their, their origin. If you go back and look at the Declaration of Independence, it's written for an international audience. And it talks about, it's basically an international law indictment of King George III. Quite early on uh, in the Jay Treaty of 1795 is one of the first efforts to put in arbitration uh, provisions. Uh, in 1817, we have a treaty uh, with uh, Britain called the Russ Badgett Treaty with Canada that starts to demilitarize the Great Lakes, which leads to a historic relationship uh, between uh, the United States and Canada. So, um, and then after actually the Civil War, there's an arbitration about uh, some Confederate raiders, the Alabama and the Florida, that uh, leads to a grant to the United States to partly absolve uh, some of the British concerns. But the one challenge with the international law idea is the Senate doesn't like to give up authority in advance. So they will accept arbitrations, but sort of one by one as they go forward. But then where Root is a fascinating figure is that he is one of the country's most successful international lawyers at the time of William McKinley and the Spanish-American War. McKinley uh, calls up and says, I want you to be the Secretary of War. And Root says, this is absurd. I know nothing about the war. And, and McKinley says, 
I don't want you uh, as, as an experienced warrior, I want you to help me with the challenge of the Philippines and Cuba. So in a sense, he's trying to come up with a legal formula for the brief American sort of era of colonialism. And it's interesting how they try to look to rights and, and civil government. Uh, there are certainly big flaws in their system, but what's intriguing is, remember, at this era around 1900, much of the European powers in Japan were looking about sort of territories they can take. And instead, the United States is trying to figure out how can we govern these uh, in, in, a, in a different system. Uh, and when the Treaty of Versailles comes back to the Senate um, under Woodrow Wilson, it's Root who comes up with the idea of reservations that we think about. And I think there's a pretty good case that uh, Wilson could have gotten the treaty through uh, with those reservations, but instead he decided to go to the public, fight for a treaty without any reservations, and we know how that ended up because he, he had a stroke and, and failed. And then um, Root goes on to push the whole question of a world court, notion of arbitration system as well as an international judicial system. And this is much debated across sort of the rest of American history, but one point I wanted to remind here is that when you read about rules-based orders internationally, think of Elahuru, because when it's a, if it's a question of regimes, whether it's for health or telecommunications or trade or others, what Root was talking about was systems that could help share information, uh, build cooperation, build a sense of common interest, slowly build sort of institutions uh, and processes, encourage mediation. And those are very relevant issues for the exact things that you, you opened with and, and mentioned today, Bill. So um, these, these were people who were trying to build on the American experience with law and see if it could apply internationally. Now there's a contrast. So for the generation of Dean Acheson, they come up with what lawyers call legal realism. So they're more focused on power relations as opposed to societal development of law. And I close this chapter with an interesting debate I found with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who many of you will know. Uh, it was in 2006, the centennial of the founding of the uh, American International Law Society. And, uh, and there are three points of view. Anne-Marie is basically, you need to have democratic states to have an international law system. Another commentator says, well, actually, international law becomes a discipline on, on, on democratic states, stopping them from doing some things, or at least restricting them. And then the third takes the view that the problem that Root and others never overcame was that you can't build law until you have security stability. So he takes the more the, sort of the legal realism point of view. So this is the, the one reason I included this chapter, is that whether we're discussing war or whether we're discussing cooperative arrangements, uh, international law will be part of our overall debate. And Bill, I'm sure you know this from, from your diplomatic experience. So it's not the dominating idea, but it's an important tradition. No, it's a really interesting feature. And to, to leap ahead a little bit in the 20th century to some you know better known figures and better known episodes, you write really thoughtfully about American statecraft during the great hinge points you know, over the course of the last century. You talked already about Wilson after World War I, and then you write uh, about the architects of the post-World War II alliance system. And then, of course, there was the diplomacy of the George H.W. Bush administration and his very formidable team at the end of the Cold War, in which you played such a central role. I think the death of Brent Scowcroft a few days ago, who was um, as fine and decent a human being and as accomplished a public servant as I've ever known, is a reminder of the quality of that group of American statesmen at a moment of truly profound international change. So tell us a little bit about that team, how it worked, and what its biggest achievements were. Well, uh, as you mentioned, this is a, a moment in particularly in reflection since we both had an opportunity to work with Brent, who was an extraordinary patriot. Um, I think a key part of his story was the team and the team was led by President Bush 41. Um, I titled that chapter Alliance Leader because in many respects, uh, President Bush 41 represented the best character, characteristics of, of Alliance leadership. He obviously came to office being quite uh, engaged and knowledgeable about foreign policy. He loved the personal interconnections. As you may recall, 
some world leaders are actually surprised when Bush would call them at first and they thought, well, this must be some fake call. Uh, but it's how he sort of stayed in touch with people. What I think a lot of people don't recognize about Bush, however, is because he was a gentleman and because he liked the word prudent, they don't fully appreciate how competitive he was. This is a man who, who liked to win. He didn't want to be in second place. And I think this leads to a critical role of his relationship with our common boss, Secretary Baker, because you can't really understand the Bush administration without understanding the Bush-Baker relationship. These were two very close friends. They suffered together. They succeeded together. Uh, they were both highly competitive. And they understood each other's sort of complementary roles. And Baker understood that Bush didn't want to be in second place, that he wanted to get ahead. So some of the tendencies, for example, towards the Soviet Union early on that Brent had or Bob Gates had or Dick Cheney had didn't really reflect that Bush wanted to sort of get on offense. And as you know, uh, Baker rose every morning with the idea of action, what can we get done, how to focus on results, how to put together coalitions, how to make things happen. So that relationship is very critical. And what I tried to focus also in particular is a lot of historians have overlooked um, as they debate what led to the end of the Cold War. As you'll recall, in 1989, we felt the Cold War started in the heart of Europe, the Iron Curtain, division of Germany. And until that was resolved, the Cold War wasn't resolved. But we had a problem. <laughs> the problem was, after the elimination of intermediate range missiles, nuclear missiles, the only ones left were the short range missiles. And as the Germans said, the shorter the missiles, the deader the Germans. So there was a desire on the German part to negotiate and certainly not modernize them. Bush comes up in May with a very bold initiative to shift the priority from pure nuclear arms negotiations to conventional forces. And historians almost totally sort of overlook the, the dynamic of, of this, what this created. And obviously, there were political effects for Eastern Europe and others. But it emphasized the fact that Germany was the, the, the Schwerpunkt, the central point of the relationship. And the partnership with Germany would be absolutely vital as Bush establishes himself as the leader of alliance, which he does through this proposal and the, the May uh, 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 NATO sort of summit meeting. That obviously positions him quite well for the war what follows uh, with the events of November and, and German unification. One of the little contrarian positions I also point out here is there's a, you'll see in much of the literature, idea of sort of Bush's prudence led to a pause during all of 1989. And what I think this fundamentally misses is, is that people who focused on the Soviet Union and Russia wanted more attention on that, where Bush first felt as an alliance leader, he needed to strengthen his relations with Germany and the NATO alliance. So it's, if you want Germany first and the German problem over uh, the priority for the Russia problem. But frankly, he felt you needed the Germany and the alliance to deal with the Russian issue. So if you actually reflect in, by May, he's got this bold conventional forces proposal, successful NATO alliance. He also, people have overlooked, goes to Japan after uh, Emperor Hirohito's death. He has the visit to, to, to China. Uh, Baker, and I was involved with this, finally put to bed the Central America and the Nicaraguan sort of peace plan. He also, Bush also takes a trip to Eastern Europe. All this is within the first five or six months. It's a little hard to say that's a boss. But I think as I reflect uh, partly on sort of the Bush model, people have often asked about it. I think um, you know it wasn't a unilateral model. It wasn't a hierarchical model. It wasn't a balance of power model. It's a network model. It's the notion of the United States as the central node. And I think the last thing I'll mention is again, most of the histories about Bush focus on the end of the Cold War and then the Gulf War. And one of the ironies that I sort of, uh, stress is, is that in many ways, President Bush administration lays the foundation stones for the next two presidents, Clinton and, and Bush 43, who got 16 years, two terms. He only had one term. Because in addition to the items I mentioned, you then had the Middle East peace process, which you know well. Uh, you had NAFTA being completed in the Uruguay round, almost completed. The agriculture issue was solved in December. You have this uh, creation of APEC, um, an initiative for Latin America dealing with sort of debt and investment. 
And one that is totally forgotten is uh, the only treaty the United States has ever been able to get through the Senate on climate change mm -hmm. was under President Bush. And that is still relevant today because that's the framework agreement in which the Paris and all the other accords follow. So one term presidency, uh, but a lot accomplished through, I think, some unique leadership and partnership with his team. And one of the interesting features, you just mentioned it, Bob, too, in, in Bush 41 foreign policy was the focus on North America, which, again, as you describe in the book, is one of the you know five central traditions that you identify in American foreign policy. Um, it seems a little anomalous today when you know the current administration has achieved the rare diplomatic feat of pissing off both the Canadians and the Mexicans. But talk a little bit not just about the Bush 41 experience, but about the significant of the significance of North America as the natural strategic home base in a way for the United States. Yeah, this is one I wanted to emphasize because, as you know, if you go to most foreign policy forums <clears throat> and you ask about priorities, well, people will talk about Europe or Asia or China or the Mideast, and rarely does anybody mention North America. Um, but obviously, in the 19th century, North America was the heart of what the United States uh, was focused on in terms of its, its territory, its uh, creating a, a continental republic. But also, even if you think through the 20th century, think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, sort of in the importance of the Caribbean. Um, think about Venezuela today. Or I would argue, if you ask the American public what they're interested in, they're often interested in issues like immigration or the debate over the wall. They're interested in issues like uh, organized crime networks and narcotics issues. They're interested in environmental topics that no uh, no boundaries. Um, and frankly, you know, if you look at Mexican politics today, I would be willing to bet that over the next five years, we're going to face some serious challenges with Mexico uh, if they are going to be able to struggle through both the pandemic and the, and the economy. And then, as you mentioned, it's not only avoiding negatives, or I should add the Arctic to that as well, is, is that my uh, belief is that the United States will be much more influential in Europe and with China and others if we look upon North America as 500 million people, three democracies, energy self-sufficiency, better demographics, and we see what we can do as a continent. And this affects, frankly, policy. If I were going to be negotiating with Britain today for a trade agreement, I'd do it with the three North American countries. When, uh, when former Vice President Biden comes up with a Buy America proposal for trade, I make it a Buy North America proposal. So it's a good example of how history has, in some ways, sort of lost, people have lost track about the importance of it, but I think it will rear its head inevitably, and we need to take account of it. No, I think especially at this moment, just as you said, um, one of the things that you, you write about, you know, very clearly in the book, and it's obviously going to be a huge challenge for American foreign policy for many years to come, are the whole set of global challenges from climate change to global health, the next pandemic, the revolution in technology, which require, whether we like it or not, not just international cooperation, but a form of multilateralism in the sense of, you know, working with coalitions of countries, investing and reforming international institutions. Now that you know, cuts against oftentimes the rugged individualism in the American self-image, and it comes with some constraints. It comes with worries about allies taking advantage of us or international institutions failing um, to do their job, something that President Trump, I think, has, has tapped into but didn't invent. So what does history tell us about selling the idea of multilateralism to the wider American public as, as a matter of our own enlightened self-interest? A lot easier said than done. No, it's a very important question, as you say, particularly today. <clears throat> and I think looking across the centuries, <laughs> I think there are two important approaches. One is uh, some US leaders have made an analogy of multilateralism to the US experience. And I'll give some examples of that. And then the second is threat and danger and a recognition that the United States has to work with others. So in the first context, I talk a little bit about Henry Clay, 
who American historians know him as the founder of the American system for the Whig Party. He first uses American system in a hemispheric context. And he wants to take the notion of republics, the principle of neutrality, independence, economic relations. There's a, there's a sort of a vignette about the Panama Congress, which he's, he wants to send delegates to, and they don't quite sort of make it in time. It somewhat symbolizes America's relationship with Latin America. But he was building on the early American sort of Republican uh, spirit, small r Republican. Um, then I mentioned this point about union. Uh, and you can see this idea of the notion of a successful confederation, federation, set of network, again, always trying to avoid an alliance system that sort of permeates some, some of US thinking. Then there's the international law tradition, which I mentioned, which uh, is quite strong early on from sort of Daniel Webster uh, to others about US experience about how you build uh, a network of relationships beyond pure power. When Woodrow Wilson uh, enters World War I and he talks about his aims for collective security, he consciously says it's applying the Monroe Doctrine abroad. He turns the Monroe Doctrine on its head. And he said, we're not gonna, I don't want entangling alliances, I want disentangling alliances. He talks about sort of the nature of the relationship. So you can see how they're, they're trying to explain international ties uh, through the parlance of, of American language. I talk about trade as a key issue. From the start in 1776, I think many people would be surprised about this, Americans thought trade would be their principal foreign policy because it moved beyond states. It brought in what we now call transnational actors or private actors or others in the process. And whether it's the opening to Japan, whether it's the open door doctrine with China, whether it's GATT, WTO rules, this is part of the sort of American attitude. Um, or even bodies like the G7 and G20, which are in the global financial crisis, frankly, serve US sort of self-interest. But then there's the threat. So clearly the great era of alliance building in 47, 49, 1947, 49, builds off the American uh, sort of sense of the, of the disaster of the 1930s and the breakdown of an international system. And in 1947-49, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical as if we would have built this system if it hadn't been for the sense of threat uh, from, from communism and the Soviet Union. And as we've talked about, for the next 70 years, a lot of the challenge will be the skillful alliance leaders. Berlin, but Vietnam, how far do you extend this? So I'd close today by suggesting, I think both of those would apply. So clearly there's a set of, of threat from China. And I think if the United States is wise, it will work with others, whether through the WHO or through our alliance arrangements, um, not to try to contain China, which is impossible, but how do, we, how do we promote our interests and get things that we want in China and perhaps not give up on the idea that there are forces within China that might also be subject to change over time. But then also, as you said, if I, if I think about an agenda for a next administration, biological security ought to be pretty high on my agenda, not only this pandemic, but, but those that could come. Uh, issues of environmental and energy security, uh, digital security and cyber security, but also the opportunities, inclusive economic growth. Um, and finally, how this network will deal with the future of free societies. So whether it's sort of threat or sharing the American experience about trying to get sort of group action, I suspect that would be the soundest foundation on which to build going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob, I want to turn in just a second to questions from our audience, because we've got a number that have come in already and come back to the point that you made about China as well, because several of those questions revolve around that. A crucial challenge, I think, for future American policymakers. But before I get to that, I want to ask you about another of the challenges that obviously faces American foreign policy today, and that is the absence of diversity, you know, amongst practitioners. I mean, each of the practitioners that you featured in in the book are white males, um, and for too much of our history, um, the absence of diversity, I think, has been a massive handicap um, and a massive failing in American diplomacy and American foreign policy. So how important is it to accelerate 
um, efforts to shape an American diplomatic service that looks more like the society it represents overseas, and also to uh, increase diversity, equity, and inclusion amongst both practitioners and thinkers about American foreign policy. Well, I had the good fortune, as you know, to, to lead the World Bank for five years. And I actually found one of the wonderful opportunities was drawing people from 180 countries actually gave you <clears throat> insights and, frankly, uh, approaches that you wouldn't get if you were just doing the U.S. government. And so I actually also consciously made sure that uh, at the top levels, over half were women and over half were for developing countries, because I do believe this only happens if the people at the top make a conscious effort. In the book, it's interesting. I've reflected on the point. Yeah, I was somewhat limited by, by, by chronology. But I'll tell you a small way I try to deal with it. Um, obviously, women had some of their greatest opportunities through literature. So when I talk about um, the Civil War, I talk about Harriet Beecher Snow and the, the power of Uncle Tom's Cabin. We talked about international law. Probably very few people on this uh, call will recognize that the first woman uh, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize was Bertha von Suttner, an Austrian woman who wrote another book about war that sort of led to an arbitration movement. <clears throat> and in the case of China, which you mentioned, the role of Pearl Buck uh, and her books going into movies. So it was a, it's a connection to that I wanted to emphasize to her ideas in literature uh, as well as through the formal uh, processes. But I think today, um, one also has to build the pipeline. Um, so <clears throat> there's a certain amount you can do as a senior official in terms of paying attention to making sure you create a more sort of diverse leadership. But I think whether it's through educational systems, uh, I hope through books like this that will sort of interest uh, different audiences that to sort of play a role uh, in the world and the country. Um, and then I also, at a personal level, just share that um, what I found uh, as the president of the World Bank is that you, you, the DNA of appointments tends to replicate itself. So you kind of have to break through the system to draw people in who might not have some of the full background or credentials. <clears throat> but then you can't just leave it with that. You, you have to coach the people. And also, when some struggle, you have to figure out either how to help them or help them sort of uh, land in a different fashion. So I think this is a, a challenge that runs throughout the American and I might also add international system. Now, it's really important, just, just as you just argued. Um, one last question for me, which is in a way connected to that, and that is the, the, the connection between domestic and congressional support and successful foreign policy, you know, something that each of the most effective practitioners that you've spoken about um, clearly appreciated. I mean, it was no accident that our former boss, Secretary of State Baker, entitled his memoir, The Politics of Diplomacy. That really seems like an alien concept in today's polarized, you know, American political system, too, when, you know, commitments and policy seems to flip from administration to administration. So is it possible to recapture that sense? And how do you go about doing it? Well, the, the audience will be amused that uh, Bill is one of the most successful and senior <clears throat> foreign service officers. And I used to have a joke about the fact that a member of the State Department professionals would have extremely sophisticated views of other people's governmental systems, formal and informal. But when it came time to the U.S. government, they kind of left off with, you know, fifth grade with the three bodies of government and kind of how laws are made. So as you said, uh, one of the points I try to draw in through the book is that this is fundamental to the success of foreign policy. <clears throat> ben Franklin has to deal with a Congress. Um, and in fact, he actually kind of uses the Congress in some ways to counter <laughs> some, some of his more sort of difficult colleagues. But at the end, um, he actually uh, is asked by Henry Lawrence, who's the father, by the way, of Lawrence in the Hamiltonian production, uh, <clears throat> he said, you know, don't you think there'll be a great uh, praise for the success of our treaty? And, uh, and Franklin says, you know, I'm afraid blessed are the peacemakers only applies in the afterlife. And sure enough, Congress finds things to complain about. Uh, Hamilton uh, is a figure uh, that early on comes up almost with a, what we would call a strategic dialogue with Britain 
<clears throat> that actually was parallel with the, the brief period of Lord Shelburne's leadership. They could have head off a, a different U.S.-British relationship, but the public doesn't support it in either case. Thomas Jefferson uses public opinion quite effectively to sort of create pressure uh, for the Louisiana Purchase. Um, the Monroe Doctrine, many people may not be aware of, was, there's a view from Ernest May and others, it was partly about John Quincy Adams' political positioning for the 1824 election. Uh, <clears throat> but there's also the limits, and this is also interesting. So you can see with John Hay or Teddy Roosevelt, America's racing, reaching the international stage but is it really willing to devote all this international power? How does it try to, uh, Roosevelt turns to the notion of mediation. He mediates a crisis, the first Moroccan crisis uh, that could have led to World War I, but he's very careful to do it behind the scenes because he, uh, he doesn't want the Congress criticizing him for being involved with European affairs. So I, one reason I included in the 47, 49 period, the role of Senator Vandenberg, is I wanted to emphasize, I think, the critical role that certain members of Congress, probably most likely senators, can play at points in time. I think John McCain tried to play this role. Sam Nunn tried to play this role. Dick Luger played this role. And so in part to answer your question today, I would look to some of those figures and across administrations, try to see how you can build some sort of bipartisan effort and as you mentioned, it works a lot better if you've got people like Baker or Elihu Root or Charles Evans Hughes or others who know how to work the congressional system. But the bottom line to your question is, unless you bring the public along and the representatives to the Congress, I don't think you're going to have a successful foreign policy. Mm. Let me turn now to questions from our audience because we have a number of them already. And again, Bob's book is America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Um, Bree S. asks, how has technology changed diplomacy? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I included a chapter uh, <clears throat> about a man named uh, Van Iver Bush. And you probably won't find him in most traditional foreign policy studies. Uh, but the reason I wanted to include him is uh, people often talk about geopolitics and then more recently geoeconomics. And I wanted to emphasize the role of science and technology, both because I think it was very important in what Bush helped create sort of a, a science strategy that is referred to as the triple helix system where you have basic government research, universities, private sector, I think in the success in the Cold War. I think it'll be a question for us today with China, but then there's the broader question about how do governments make science and policy together, which you'd see in epidemic issues, you'd see in climate change issues. Um, and Bush was a fascinating figure um, in trying to accomplish that. Uh, and I open up with sort of three incidents, the first atomic bomb test, which he was the key liaison with, this study that he launched about science, the endless frontier that shapes future policy. And you can't make this stuff up. He writes an article in Atlantic magazine in 1945 that basically kind of imagines what becomes the personal computer. And so some of his students and the people who read the article become the founders of personal computer. So I wanted to say that I think technology will be even more important. Then there's, there's smaller pieces. So for example, how do things like the transatlantic cable affect the nature of diplomacy? Uh, I think some of this you have to find the notes, but uh, that when the Russians wanted to secure the sale of Alaska properly, they uh, had to send a telegraph or a phone message and it cost them a bundle because they had to do it in a short space of time. So I think clearly the conduct of diplomacy has, has also changed. And that's a subject that I think Bill could probably speak with uh, from his experience. Another, another question, um, Bob, comes from Diana S. And she asks, Trump's brand of diplomacy and foreign policy is unusual, to say the least. Are there any historical parallels for such disruption in American diplomacy? Well, he may be unique. <laughs> uh, there's a debate, uh, including, uh, I see, saw an interesting show about sort of Jacksonian scholars about uh, this comes from Walter Russell Mead. Um, actually, as Jacksonian scholars will point out, Jackson's foreign policy wasn't anything like the image of, of, of Jackson, including 
uh, with Britain or on trade policy. I think, I think the way I would look at it is that um, Trump, uh, in addition to kind of the, the individual nature, uh, cuts against some of these traditions I talk about. Uh, Bill emphasized the importance of North America. Well, he's obviously not focusing on that. Uh, the trade relations. Well, Trump's the first person, president since Hoover declares himself a protectionist. Alliance relations, he sees these in sort of a transactional form. The notion of America having a higher purpose doesn't rank for him. So in some ways, he's the outlier in the, my perspective that kind of heightens the sort of the significance of these issues on on uh, the U.S. nature of foreign policy. But uh, for those that want to challenge him, I think it comes back to the point that, that Bill and I talked about. He did tap into something in the public attitude. In my view, is a rather negative approach, uh, and it's one that encouraged some of the darker sides uh, in the U.S. culture and history. Uh, but it's real and it's there, and there are justifiable reasons for some of the frustrations that people had. So I think the takeaway I would have uh, on those who want to follow Trump goes back to the question that Bill asked. How do you, how do you emphasize U.S. national interests, but also an American, a different type of American leadership, given the types of problems that we face? Another question from uh, Garrett um, follows on that, and that is, what expectations should Americans have about the time it will take and the action steps that would be required to restore a sense of confidence in American leadership in a new administration? So um, on this one, again, I, I have what might be a more singular view among uh, Bill and my colleagues. Um, if you talk to foreign policy specialists, given the Trump years, there's a desire to change a lot of things fast. There's a lot of, of things they'd like to reverse. Um, but going back to the reality of politics, I think if, if, if Mr. Biden's elected, one has to recognize he's gonna face a staggering agenda domestically. <clears throat> he's got a pandemic, he's got the problems of the healthcare system, he's got inclusive economic growth, he's got sort of racism and systemic issues, he's got environmental energy issues, he's got immigration issues. Um, and the American political system can only deal with so much at a time. Go back and look at the Carter administration, Democratic president, Democratic Congress, Clinton, Obama, uh, even as they tried to push rather aggressive agendas, they suffered after sort of two years of that effort. And so even though um, former Vice President Biden, I think, enjoys international affairs, he enjoys the, the relationships, I think they have to be very disciplined in their approach and how much he can take on. And my suggestion, building on the exchange that Bill and I had actually, is I would try to leverage off some of the domestic issues. So if you do something on immigration, perhaps starting with dreamers, can you connect it to a North American approach and the follow up with the USMCA, the new trade agreement, which and the challenges that that Mexico is facing? Um, if you do something on climate and the environment, can we use that not just to rejoin the Paris Accord, but in some ways as a catalyst to pull together some of the developing country interests with avoided deforestation or energy efficiency, different technologies, soil carbon for Africa. I think there's a potential agenda uh, on, on those topics. And so um, as I, as it, or if you think about some of the uh, other questions that we're likely to face uh, in the transnational agenda, there's often domestic corollaries that one could leverage off internationally. And together, I think they will lead to improved relationships with Europe and allies and better position us to deal with the changes in China. And frankly, also better position us to deal with the notion of the future of, of free societies. So uh, I, I, that's how I would try to approach the agenda, but I, I'm an outlier. So right now, no. everybody wants to do everything. The reality is it's gonna be hard to do. Yeah, priorities is always the hardest thing to do, just as you rightly underscore. And But I think it's that connection with domestic renewal that's going to be crucially important because, you know, the absence, at least the felt absence of that connection is not something that Donald Trump invented. I mean, it's it's seen and, and felt by a lot of Americans. So I, I absolutely agree with you on that front. Let me ask you a last... Carnegie has done some interesting work on this. Though I, I, I mean, I really... 
am excited by some of the work you've done looking at particular states and, and ask what, what, what do people look at in international relations? And to be slightly hopeful here, you know, if you look yeah. at a lot of the polls and attitudes, whether it's about trade or alliances coming out of the Chicago Council, or frankly, younger generations with a sense of interconnection, uh, there, are, there are trends to work with here. But as my stories reveal, it doesn't just happen. You have to put it together. It didn't. And you got to listen a little bit, too. And you you mentioned, Bob, a report that uh, Carnegie is going to put out in September, um, which is based on some quite detailed case studies of how people, citizens in Ohio and Colorado, Nebraska, see the value of foreign policy. What matters to them? What kind of foreign policy do they want to see to serve their own interests and, in, you know, better job opportunities and a healthier climate and a healthier economy, too? And I think it's quite interesting just in underscoring the point that you just made. So a last nice, easy okay, question. Bill, just one more point on this is that, remember, we mentioned North America. Look, this is I've made this argument for Republicans, but maybe it'll be good for Biden. He's not quite as strong with, uh, with Latinos and Hispanic Americans. The right approach to Mexico on these issues could solidify his holding in southwestern states for his party for the future. So <clears throat> how you integrate the domestic politics with attitudes and your foreign policy objectives can be done constructively. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. And in that sense, I think that the hand that the United States has to play is still a pretty strong one, you know, if, if you connect those dots in that way. So I can't leave the conversation without asking you about certainly the central geopolitical challenge for the United States as far out as you can see into the 21st century, and that's China. So let me frame the question this way. What guidance do you think history, history of American diplomacy offers for uh, managing U.S.-China relations in the years ahead? So uh, you've got some excellent people like Evan Feigenbaum that can talk about the current issues. But as I reflect about U.S.-China relations over the years, I guess I would focus on three themes. Um, first, uh, the United States, from the very founding, actually, even before the Constitution, uh, looked upon the China market as the great dream, the commercial view of China. And it was often uh, kind of a a shining object a little over the horizon that we couldn't quite achieve. But I will say, you know, prior to the Trump administration, China was the fastest growing export market for the U.S. for 15 years. Second, there's been a recognition about China's potential influence as a power or as a force, uh, certainly within Asia and perhaps globally. So people forget at the time of the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, the Europeans had carved up Africa, and they were about ready to do the same thing with China. In the United States, what part of the whole open door notes was to preserve the territorial integrity of China. In the 1920s, when Republic of China was just trying to get off, the, well, the period I talk about with Charles Evans Hughes and the arms control is in part to give a chance for Republican China uh, to rise. Franklin Roosevelt obviously looked upon China potentially as one of the four horsemen. Um, Nixon Kissinger looked upon China as a force, and now we look upon China sort of as a, as a threatening and dangerous force. But the third theme is the United States' early relations with China were often shaped by missionaries. I talked about Pearl Buck. And we've been wanting to convert China uh, to Christianity, to small r republicanism, to sort of our view of the American dream for, frankly, centuries. And what I've watched in the relationships historically is that when the Chinese decide they want to be Chinese as opposed to junior Americans, there's a strong sense of rejection in the United States. We feel that we've reached out and, and that we respond with fear and anger. You saw this after 1949 and 50 in the Korean War and right in China. And there's like a pendulum in relations. So I guess the context that I would uh, set for the future is to say, you know, we need to accept China as it is, as opposed to the dream that we might want it to be. That doesn't mean that we don't try to work with China and sort of find the common interest and also stand for our values along the way. But I think if we get to another one of these periods of rejection of China, sort of say that it has to be the enemy, and frankly, our relations now are in free fall, as Evan Feigenbaum said. I don't know where the floor is. Every day there's sort of a, a, a new set of departure. It's not going to work well for either country or the world. 
Well, Bob, I hate to bring a fascinating conversation to a close, but I want to thank you for a terrific discussion and a brilliant book, which again is America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Bob, thanks again, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Take good care. Thanks, Bill.